Taking the entirety of the Dragon Ball franchise into account, Broly is a strong competitor for the character with the most potential, and the question of what would happen if other characters possess such potential comes up often. In specific, what would happen if Goku was born with Broly's potential? To start this off, as we saw with Broly, Goku would be born with an abnormal power level on Planet Vegeta. This would certainly place him with the children who are born of powers with that range, but Goku would be different. His power level would fluctuate much more than the others, sometimes being at 2, other times it would be at a few hundred, and on rare occasions it would even go up to thousands. King Vegeta would be informed of the baby like he was with Broly, and getting flashbacks to Broly, he plans to exile him to Vampa as well. Around the same time, Bardock and the rest of the Saiyans are called back to Planet Vegeta by Frieza's forces for unknown reasons. Bardock gets an uneasy feeling and goes to see Gine about getting Kakarot off Planet Vegeta, but when he goes to see her, she's distraught. They wouldn't let her enter the incubation chambers where Kakarot was being held. She heard rumors about some baby with abnormal powers and remembered the kid that King Vegeta had sent away years prior. Bardock understood and started a plan for Kakarot's retraction before before Vegeta exiled him, or worse, Frieza killed all of them. He would wait till night and take out both of the guards as quietly as he possibly could. When he gets inside, he sees Kakarot. However, the only way to get him out was to blow up the incubation chamber. As he does, alarms start to blare, and the king's guards charge at Bardock. He fights them as best he can, but hands Kakarot off to Gine while he deals with them. He can take on a few, but the amount coming at him may be too much to handle. He sends a blast, creating an opening for Gine, who escapes and puts Kakarot in a pod. She sets coordinates for Earth and sends him off looking at the sky. A guard stabs her through the the stomach, killing her. Bada gets enraged, but as he looks up at the sky, it's already too late. Frieza sends down a supernova, dooming planet Vegeta. As per usual, Goku lands on Earth, specifically at Mount Pauzu where Gohan would find him. Gohan raises Goku as he normally would, but there's tricky times when his power spikes. Sometimes his power would increase out of nowhere, pushing Gohan back. Gohan would be shook every time it happens. He just considers Goku special, which he certainly is. Gohan would be able to deal with these outbursts until Goku turns into a great ape one night. That night is when Gohan meets his end. As we saw in the opening pages of Dragon Ball, Goku has kind of a training routine even before he had a master. The training he does, no matter how light, would cause a great increase in his power. He would be much more powerful by the time he runs into Bulma. When her car slams into him, it would get crushed. The two of them would go on their adventure to find the Dragon Balls in which Master Roshi would take a great interest in Goku. Yamcha would be easily defeated and the Great Ape isn't even required for Goku to break out of Pilaf's castle, but he does eventually turn into one, and when he does, disaster strikes. The Pilaf gang is killed, but the wish is still wasted because of Oolong. Goku would go on a train with Roshi alongside Krillin and Yamcha. Being so easily beaten by Goku would give Yamcha motivation to train, so hearing about the legendary Toro Hermit, he would jump at the opportunity to train with him. They all would train for about 8 months until the 21st World Martial Arts Tournament. In that time, everyone around Goku realizes just how different he is. They all grow from the training, but Goku's power increases exponentially higher than theirs. At the tournament itself, Yamcha would replace Giren, fighting Goku in the quarterfinals. While he has grown quite fond of Goku in their training, he still wants to prove himself. Training alongside Krillin and a much stronger Goku would give Yamcha a strong boost in power as well, but compared against Goku, it's absolutely nothing. By throwing Yamcha outside of the ring, he's defeated, and Goku wins. Krillin would eventually face Jackie Chan, and he too is more powerful as a result of Goku. However, Roshi was pulling late nights, actually training because of his students' power growth. He wasn't actually sure if he could beat them. He and Krillin have a spectacular fight, displaying many great techniques and feats, resembling the fight that Goku and Roshi had in the original. Roshi does end up using his thunder shock attack to freeze Krillin in the air and knocks him out. Goku beats Nam and unbeknownst to him, eventually faces off against his master in the finals. A sweat drops down Roshi's face as he charges towards Goku, unsure of how this fight will play out. Goku ducks underneath and grabs Roshi's collar, slamming him into the ground with immense force. Roshi gets up, firing a Kamehameha Goku uses his hand to disperse the blast. Goku appears in front of Roshi, punching him in the stomach, which drops a martial artist to his knees. He prepares a blast point at his opponent's head, but Roshi bulks up, grabbing onto Goku's tail, which immobilizes him for a split second. Roshi tries to toss Goku out of the ring, but all of a sudden, his power explodes. Goku's eyes go blank as he looks up at the full moon. Yamcha immediately understands what's happening, and they all start to freak out. With Goku's power, they'll all surely die, and that's exactly what happens. Roshi is unable to destroy the moon, with Goku being as strong as he is, and the others don't provide much help. Goku stomps down and fires blasts from his mouth, killing everyone in the audience, including all of his friends. Goku then becomes an actual danger to the planet. With his power and potential being equal to Broly's, Goku is an absolute monster. He could quite literally destroy the planet, and in that exact moment, that realization sets in for the god of Earth, Kami. Kami is well aware that Goku's power is unstoppable. He wouldn't even stand a chance. He debates something he would never imagine doing under any other circumstance in his mind, but decides against it unless absolutely necessary. What he knows for sure is that Goku could cause a lot of damage, but that damage can be reversed if he just used the Dragon Balls. He decides to go with a safer option for now because he knows the Dragon Balls need to live on. He lets Goku lay waste to everything he possibly can, and when the night passes and Goku is passed out, Kami brings him up to the lookout and has Popo keep an eye on him. For some odd reason, Popo was able
able to keep Super Saiyan Goten and Trunks at bay in the Buu Saga. So for now, he should be able to deal with Goku if he wakes up and becomes hostile. Teleporting around, Kami collects the Dragon Balls one by one and makes a wish to fix all of the damage that Goku caused in the night prior. This would bring back everyone he killed, which includes Roshi, Yamcha, Krillin, and Bulma. Luckily, the Z Fighters aren't set to die for good just yet. Unlike Goku, they all remember what happened and are extremely confused. The first question that comes to their mind would be, where is Goku? On the lookout, Kami and Popo closely watch Goku, unsure of what they're actually going to do once he wakes up. Kami's first action is cutting off his tail, which he manages to do while Goku's asleep. But as soon as he does this, Goku would wake up screaming in pain. He frantically looks around, only seeing two people. He questions where he is and how he got here, prompting a response from Kami, who explains everything to Goku and also tells him that he brought back all of his friends, so Goku kind of owes him. He can repay that debt by staying on the lookout and training under him for a little bit. Goku's shocked that he did this. It would certainly weigh down on his conscience for a little bit, but the good part to all of this is he found Kami earlier on, before he could do damage that would be irreversible. Kami tells Goku to sit down and meditate. Down below the lookout, Bulma fixes and upgrades the dragon radar to locate the Dragon Balls once more in order to find out where Goku's hiding. But when she uses her radar, nothing comes up. Unfortunately, they have to wait at least a year before they can do anything because of the rules of the Dragon Balls themselves. They're deactivated for a year, and Bulma eventually realizes that and lets it go for the moment. The Red Ribbon Army is also on the hunt for the Dragon Balls, and Kami is aware of that fact. Once they reappear, hopefully Goku's ready to go down to the surface and deal with them. The year of training provided for Goku through Kami is immensely helpful for the Saiyan. While he grows in power, he's able to somewhat control the power that he experiences when an outburst occurs. Without the ability to turn into a great ape, Goku is danger free for now. However, the Red Ribbon Army and Bulma are both on the hunt for the Dragon Balls and Goku is sent down by Kami as an agent of order to destroy the Red Ribbon Army and collect the Dragon Balls to bring back to him. Bulma is accompanied by Krillin and Yamcha, who are both curious as to where Goku wound up as well and wanted to help in whatever way they could. In this case, they're her muscle. This way, she's safe from the Red Ribbon Army foot soldiers that try and kill her, as well as Colonel Silver, General White, and General Blue, all of which Krillin and Yamcha can take on because of their training. Goku himself attacks the Red Ribbon base of operations right off the bat, attacking the heart and cutting off the supply before things started to ramp up. Goku takes them all out, but unbeknownst to him, some of them do survive. Star Officer Black tries to compete with the Saiyan by using a suit of armor, but one Kamehameha is enough to kill him. Bulma, Krillin, and Yamcha don't need to look any longer because Goku appears to them. They have a reunion and Goku then heads off to search for the rest of the Dragon Balls with the help of Bulma's radar and a little bit of quarterbacking from Kami. Tao Pai Pai is never hired to kill Goku because Commander Red is already dead. Goku quickly and easily finds the rest of the Dragon Balls without being challenged until the very last one. But instead of needing Fortune Teller Baba's help, he simply asks Kami to guide him and direct him to the last Dragon Ball, which he easily does. However, this does mean that we avoid Goku's reunion with Grandpa Gohan, which is kind of a sad thing to lose, but the Dragon Ball is found and Goku then brings them up to the lookout to be kept safe by Kami until they are needed sometime in the future. Not long after, their next challenge comes in the form of yet another tournament. Goku would meet the rest of the Z Fighters there, where they would all encounter the train school and Roshi's rival, Master Shen. Alongside Tian and Chatsu, Tao Pai Pai would also participate in this tournament because, well, he's alive. He would replace Man Wolf. This results in Jackie Chun versus Tao Pai Pai in the quarterfinals, where a spectacular display of the Turtle Hermit and Crane School is shown. Tao fires a Donan Ray to counter Roshi's Kamehameha, but Roshi is able to overcome the assassin because of his prior training. This then leads to Krillin and Yamcha's fight, where Yamcha would still lose his fight with Tien, but Krillin would stand tall, and alongside his higher battle power, he would use his smarts to best Chaozu. Goku and Krillin would fight in the semis, and the two would have a great rivalry battle, but in the end, the fight goes to Goku. With Roshi winning against Tao, he faces Tien next, and though he is considerably powerful, Roshi doesn't actually actually want to beat Tien. He tries to give him some wisdom before dropping out, and this leads to the finals in which Goku and Tien face off. The two start off on blow for blow, and Tien tries to use his various techniques to throw Goku off. He tries to create extra arms to try and attack Goku with more punches, but he's able to block everything. He goes a step further, proceeding to split himself into four, but Goku utilizes the after image to best that. Tien flies up and fires a tri beam, but to his surprise, Goku takes it head on. He cups his hands together, starting to prepare a Kamehameha. He fires the attack and takes some pushback, but ultimately bests Tien. The Total Hermit School is victorious. With Goku killing the Pilaf gang earlier in the series, they aren't able to unleash King Piccolo onto the world. Luckily, this means that there's no danger to the world in the form of King Piccolo or Piccolo Jr. later down the road, which also means eight whole years of peace. Of course, there would be another tournament in this time skip following which Goku and Chi Chi get married and have Gohan. Unlike my previous series, I'm going to withhold this power from Gohan. While he is Goku's son and may inherit something, I would like to keep this potential thing strictly applied to the character and discussion of this what if. Gohan is born with Gohan's potential, which is actually a great thing anyways. Of course, following this time skip is a reunion between the Z Fighters and which Raditz would attack them. However, not only is Goku a monster in power, but so are all the Z Fighters. 
with Goku's power being the level that they all strive for, with Goku's power being as high as it is, they would all strive to get closer and closer to it. Not stopping when they thought there was peace because there was still a rival they had to overcome. So Krillin does not get owned by Raditz. He would attempt to attack Goku, but his brother is far too powerful for him to do anything. Raditz would eventually stand down after getting a read on Goku's power level and turns off his scouter. Raditz is cocky, but he isn't stupid. He's afraid of Vegeta and Nappa because they're stronger, but from what he's getting, Goku is actually stronger. After they get through the whole origin story presentation, Goku and Raditz fly away to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Being trained by Kami for the time he was, Goku is cautious of Raditz. He has the idea of killing when necessary built into him by the God of Earth, but until he feels that need, he's going to hear his so-called brother out. The conversation that follows is Raditz explaining what his life has been, the destruction of their home, being under Vegeta and Nappa, who all serve Frieza. Goku gets excited hearing all of this. The levels of power that Raditz is describing right now is something he wants to face, every bit of it. But at the same time, he feels sorry for his brother. Yes, he came to Earth with the mindset of destroying the planet and taking him to do the same to other worlds, but from what it looks like, Raditz has changed his mind. He's willing to work on himself, and if he's willing to do that, then Goku won't stand in his way. Instead of telling his brother to leave Earth and never come back, which was what he planned to do, Goku offers him a hand. Come with me. Meet my family. Let's train. Raditz smiles, seeing a reflection of Bardock as he looks at his brother. He takes Goku's hand and the two fly off, back to Roshi's island. Everyone is still extremely wary of him. At the same time though, Raditz has decided to join Goku, but that doesn't mean he's all of a sudden fond of everyone there. He isn't in any way. He still wants to own Krillin, but Goku keeps him grounded for now. They take Gohan and fly off to Mount Pauzu, where Chi Chi gets a very weird introduction to Raditz. It's definitely a shock to her, but the way Goku is makes more sense now. Raditz immediately takes an interest in Gohan. Much like how he did originally, he's extremely intrigued by the idea of a hybrid Saiyan. One standing right in front of him, but what's the difference between Gohan and all the others? Saiyans. That's something that Raditz is surely going to look into on his time on Earth. He and Goku start to train, and initially Gohan simply watches, mimicking their movements and forming his own way of fighting. Compared to Goku at this moment, Raditz is an ant, but that's definitely beneficial for Raditz in many ways. The stronger the person he's fighting, the more motivated he is to get to that level. On top of that, the training is extremely difficult for him. He's obviously the weaker of the two, so he's always at a disadvantage. He has to be the one that has to crawl through the mud to come out on top. Another good thing that comes out of this is Zenkai. Raditz takes immense damage from these fights, so a Zenkai boost when he gets one is extremely appreciated. Somewhere along this journey of training, Gohan would of course jump in and actually train. Unlike with Piccolo, the two of them don't throw Gohan into the jungle to fend for himself. They do it in a very different way. Raditz would take charge in this training, because Goku doesn't yet realize how important Gohan will be later down the road. Raditz's way of training Gohan is similar to Piccolo's, but not exactly. Raditz is harsh, and he would definitely be down on Gohan to make him tougher. He would get Gohan extremely terrified until he mustered up the nerves to fight. At the same time, time, Goku was in charge of refining Gohan's technique and fighting capability. They would both teach him attack. He would learn the Kamehameha and to replace the Masenko that he learned from Piccolo, Raditz would teach him the Double Sunday. Both techniques would still need further practice by the time their training is over, but it's enough for now as he still has the ability to use key control, which is more than he did originally. While all of this was going on, Krillin and Yamcha were training on the lookout with Kami. They too wanted to train and not fall further and further behind. The year passes with Vegeta and Nappa crashing down to Earth, their power sensed by the fighters of Earth. Raditz is nervous to come face to face with his old comrades, but as they arrive, Nappa gets out and immediately blows up an entire city, killing hundreds of thousands of people. Goku feels all of these people dying, and his power spikes. He and the others fly to a wasteland, increasing their power to get the attention of the invaders. As Vegeta and Nappa arrive at the wasteland, their first instinct is to stare down Raditz. Vegeta doesn't appreciate traitors. If he has to, he will kill Raditz himself. He starts to laugh. Paired with the enemy, Raditz. Were you so eager to die? Raditz smirks, all of a sudden appearing in front of Vegeta. He confidently asks, Are you? Visibly shook, Vegeta doesn't know what to do, but Nappa does. He proceeds to throw a punch at Raditz, who catches the attack without taking his eyes off of Vegeta. After him, you're next. Raditz tilts his body, now facing Nappa. He grips the hand that Nappa tried to strike him with, listening to his bones crack. He kicks Nappa into the sky and fires a double sunday, killing Vegeta Kwan. So you've gotten stronger. Good, but if you think that puts you above me, keep dreaming. Nappa was nothing compared to me, and you know that. I'll put you down myself. Vegeta starts to power up as Raditz watches. He looks back at his brother, who smiles. Goku wants to fight, but he understands that Raditz needs to do this himself. Vegeta's power continues to rise until he's fully powered up, and Raditz smirks, powering up himself. The two start to battle, trading blows, Raditz putting his all into the fight as Vegeta's underestimation of his former comrade starts to backfire. Since the last time they saw each other, Raditz is stronger, he's sharper, he's faster, and he's more disciplined than Vegeta could ever be. He backs Vegeta into a corner, continuing to beat down on him 
punch after punch. He uses both hands to send Vegeta flying back as he begins to charge up a Kamehameha. He fires it at Vegeta and the Prince of Six Saiyans is killed. Raditz powers down. He knew he had to end the fight quick and not to give Vegeta a chance to turn into a Luzaru. That would have been too much for him to handle. However, he got his fun in and most of all, he killed both Vegeta and Mappa. But this isn't the end and he knows that. The next on his hit list is Frieza, and Raditz has no intention of slowing down anytime soon. Not long after the fight, Goku and Raditz are on their way to Frieza Planet 79 in order to take him down. Of course, they will train the entire way there through the use of the gravity room built in on their spaceship. However, when they get there, Frieza is nowhere to be found. Raditz and Goku take out all of the soldiers, and Raditz runs into Kui. He beats him into giving up Frieza's location. Namek. Unfortunately for them, Frieza knows about the Dragon Balls and decided to go to Namek. Without the intervention of Gohan, Krillin, and Bulma, or even Vegeta, Frieza and his soldiers had free reign over Namek. All they had to do was find the Dragon Balls, and they did, one by one. Realizing Frieza's after the Dragon Balls, Raditz is put into immediate shock. He and Goku get in their ship and set out for Namek as fast as they can. Raditz knows what this means. Frieza's going to wish for immortality as Vegeta had once planned. If that happens, there's no hope for them to win, even if they're stronger. The two are swiftly making their way over to Namek, but even at the pace they're going, it's going to take more than a few days to get there. That's plenty of time for Frieza to gather up the remainder of the Dragon Balls as he makes his way to the last one, which is located at Guru's house. Frieza walks up to the structure and enters. He tells Guru that he has no choice but to give up the Dragon Balls, and any retaliation will force his hand into killing all of the Namekians. Their best fighter, Nail, stands no chance against Frieza. Knowing what's best for his people though, Guru makes a deal. Let the rest of them live and he can take the Dragon Ball without any force against him. Frieza starts to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Eternal life about to be in his grip. As he takes the Dragon Balls away, an idea forms in Guru's mind. The only way they can use the Dragon Balls is if he's alive, but if the Dragon Balls stop working, then he's going to kill all of the Namekians. There's only one way out of all of this. Guru tells Nail that the forbidden technique of the Namekians is going to have to be used if the two of them are to save their people. Nail understands as Guru puts his hand over his guardian's head. A tear falls down his face as Guru fuses with the strongest Namekian. Nail's power explodes, passing 5 million. Frieza stands next to the Dragon Balls about to summon Purunga with the help of a Namekian, but all of a sudden they turn to stone. Frieza starts to shout, What does this mean? What happened? The Namekian starts to cry. He knows that Guru just died. Unable to give Frieza an answer he'll accept, he's killed by the Emperor. But as he kills the Namekian, Nail appears, punching Frieza miles away. He blasts Zabon and Adori into dust and chases after Frieza, punching him over and over and over again. He uses both hands, sending a blast which pushes Frieza down into the waters of Namek. As he goes in for the killing blow, Frieza's aura expands as he enters his final form. Enough of this, he shouts. Frieza kicks Nail back as Goku and Raditz arrive on the planet. They can immediately sense the immense powers wrestling with each other on the other side. The two start to fly as fast as they can. They know that one of them is Frieza, but who is the other power? As they fly, they can see the destruction on Namek, but no more. Today, they put an end to the Emperor. Speaking of, Frieza continues his battle with Nail. He's powered up to 20% of his power and is simply toying with the Namekian. Frieza starts to put death beams into the warrior, one by one, his arm, his leg, his stomach. He's torturing Nail, making his death slow. But having fused with Guru, Nail's healing is a lot stronger than it was. He's able to regenerate, but his strength is no match to Frieza. He's basically frozen in a state of pain, but he's soon saved by Goku, who comes in with a flying kick that stuns Frieza. Raditz punches the Emperor into the ground. Together, they put him down for a little bit as they give a sensu beam to Nail, healing him up. They don't exactly have time to talk as Frieza starts to power up more. He's had enough of this. He goes all out, powering up in his full power state, being far too powerful for most of them to take on. But that doesn't stop Raditz who flies into battle anyway. He tries to strike Frieza, but his attack is caught by the Emperor. Goku notices Frieza lift his hand and tries to get to him in time, but the Emperor sends a blast right through Raditz's stomach blowing his organs out. Goku punches Frieza back as Raditz falls into his arm. He rushes to give his brother a sensu beam, but Frieza fires a death beam, destroying all of them. Raditz dies in Goku's arm, his last wish being to avenge the Saiyans and kill Frieza. A rage-filled Goku lets go of his brother's body as his power explodes. His hair starts to switch between black and green. His pupils vanish as a green aura surrounds him, his hair finally settling in, turning into a green color. He looks at Frieza with a deathly stare. Goku's power fills him in an uncontrolled rage, but he can tell who his enemy is as he heads straight for Frieza. Landing blow after blow, he makes Frieza bleed. The Emperor is unable to escape Goku's grip as he begins to crush all of his bones. Goku grabs hold of his neck and crushes it. 
but he doesn't stop there. His power continues to rise. It grows and grows, and with no one to stop him, he destroys Planet Mammoth. But Goku survives. He continues to drift in space, his power protecting him from dying. Kami is in communication with King Kai as he hears about what happened on Namek. He gathers the Dragon Balls and makes the wish to bring Goku to Earth. Once upon a time, he was able to control Goku's power, or so he thought, but he never knew it would grow to this extent. Kami is put in a state of worry, but he knows his next steps. Goku doesn't wake up for days. He had been extremely deprived of air and he rests in a capsule core bed in a coma for over a month until a sensation is given to him in order to wake him up. He immediately heads out to the lookout and asks Kami a lot of questions, especially regarding what happened on Namek, how he got to Earth, and where his brother is. Kami tries his best to explain it to him in a way that wouldn't upset him, but there was no avoiding that. Goku is still happy knowing that he can bring Raditz back, but that won't be for another year. Kami needs to make the wish to bring all those who died on Namek along with the planet itself back after which they can use the Namekian Dragon Balls in order to send Raditz back to Earth. Good news is that Freeze is dead and permanently staying that way, for now. He wasn't able to make it off world in time, but that isn't as great as one would think. The Ginyu Force makes their way to planet Yardrat and destroys it without being called to Namek. After doing so, they find out Freeze had died and regroup with King Cold to attack the people that did it. By this time, Namek would be revived and they would use their Dragon Balls to not only send Raditz back to Earth, but with the other two wishes, hide their planet from other evil. King Cold and his forces are unable to find Namek, but by piecing together an investigation, they find Earth to be a place of interest. Speaking of, on Earth, Goku and Raditz have reunited. They're both happy to see each other and immediately hop back on training. It's more crucial now than ever. Raditz is sure that Goku is the legendary Super Saiyan after hearing what he heard. This form that he has is insanity, and if you could harness that power, it would open a whole new door. Not just for Goku, but for everyone trying to get stronger as well. As I said before, if one person gets stronger, the others just need to be determined enough to follow suit. Vegeta would be a great example of this. Raditz would also expand into the realm of family around this time. While I would love to go down the Masako route and put him in launch together, I think it's much more likely that without Vegeta being in the story that Raditz gets with Bulma. Of course, this would be a gradual relationship, building up over time. Raditz would initially go there to train in the gravity room, maybe even train with Goku in them. Since he already had a place to live, the only reason he would go there is if he wanted to train. But eventually, he would do it more and more just in order to see Bulma. Eventually, they would get together. Soon after, King Cold would finally decide to make his move, coming towards Earth with his soldiers as Goku, Raditz, Gohan, and the rest of the Z Fighters sense the power approaching. They all rush to the wasteland to face whatever this is, and oddly enough, they all realize that this power is very similar to Frieza's. But that's not possible. Even before they intervene though, there's already someone there, Future Trunks. For those who already know, here's a timestamp to skip the Future Trunks explanation, but for those who don't, here it is. As I've mentioned in my other stories, Future Trunks is a constant. His timeline and the main timeline are different. Whether Vegeta's alive in this story or not, in that timeline he was. So that's why Trunks is here. But back to the story. Trunks powers up into Super Saiyan and slaughters cold soldiers. He proceeds to slice King Gold in half and kills him with a close range blast. Everyone watches in awe as they wonder why his hair changed color. Trunks walks up to the Z fighters, and they're all cautious, but Goku steps forward to meet him. Trunks finds it weird that Goku's already arrived back from Yardrat. By his calculations, he shouldn't be here for another three hours, but he doesn't question it too much. He proceeds to transform into a Super Saiyan and tells Goku to do the same, but he's confused. What do you mean? I can't do that. A moment of confusion befalls Trunks as he tries to make sense of what he just heard. He reciprocates the question. What do you mean? You're supposed to know this. Goku continues to remain in confusion as Trunks realizes that he's being serious. He realizes that something is extremely wrong, but instead of panicking, he starts to question Goku. He asks if he knows what the Super Saiyan is. Goku explains that he does. Trunks is still confused. Okay, then transform into it. Goku frowns. I can't. The Super Saiyan transformation is uncontrollable. He's working to use it, but whatever it is, it just doesn't work. Trunks doesn't understand what's happening. He says that this is the Super Saiyan form, referring to his golden aura and hair, but Goku argues that it isn't. It's the one with green hair and aura. Now they're both confused. Trunks does realize that Goku's base power is immense compared to even his Super Saiyan form. He tries to strike Goku, but he doesn't even move having sensed that Trunks had no intention to strike him. But when he strikes the next time, Goku lifts up a single finger and blocks each and every swing of the sword that Trunks tries to strike him with. The two finally settle down and start the real conversation. Trunks warns Goku of the android threat soon to come. Goku and the others need to be prepared. He searches around for his father and doesn't see him. He proceeds to tell Goku that he's Vegeta and Bulma's son, to which Goku freaks out. What are you talking about? Vegeta? He's dead! Yet another shock to Trunks. Clearly something is very wrong. The last thing he tells Goku is about the heart virus. He gives Goku the medicine and proceeds to leave. After the fact, Raditz can tell that Goku is quite shook. He informs everyone of the threat of the androids and to ramp up their training. He does the same with Raditz and Gohan. He tells Raditz exactly what that kid told him. 
turns out that his form is completely different. It isn't a Super Saiyan. Whatever this Trunks had is, he acted like it was achievable by others as well, which gives Raditz some hope for increasing his power in the future. But the last kicker was that he claimed he was Vegeta and Bulma's kid. Raditz is freaked out at that fact, but of course, they can't dwell on it too much. In their three years of training, Goku would continue to try and control his green hair form, but he isn't able to. He tries to grasp the emotion he feels every time he transforms, and it feels like he goes through stages of power. From what he can tell, there's four, and if he's able to control every version one by one, maybe that's the key. In this time of training, he's able to get to the first stage, Ikari, a humanoid version of the great ape which he's just about able to control. Raditz, on the other hand, starts to train his ass off to an extreme. All he can think about is getting Super Saiyan. He puts his mind and body on the line. He thinks back to the time he found out Planet Vegeta was destroyed. His parents, the time he spent being abused by Vegeta and Nappa, the time under Frieza. All of these emotions come to the surface as Raditz's power explodes. He starts to glow, his aura turning yellow alongside his hair and his eyes changing color as well. Raditz manages to break through and unlock the Super Saiyan transformation. Sharing his discovery with Goku, the two realize that what Trunks was saying was correct. This also means that Gohan can get this power up. They all continue to train with exciting power ahead, but eventually this gap of peace is followed by destruction. They all gather up to look for the android after the three years is up, and all they hear are explosions in the city. As they arrive, they finally meet what they think are the androids. Jiro and 19 face off against the Z fighters, a terrifying look in their eyes. Goku decides to relocate the fight, and once he does, it's on. Of course, Jiro had anticipated the power growth of Z fighters, especially Goku's. He knows of Goku's extreme potential and adjusted the androids to match that exponential growth, but what he wasn't expecting was Goku's new power up. As Goku turns into Ikari, his power increases tenfold. He remains confident, but he isn't certain anymore. Goku and 19 start to fight, and Raditz doesn't want to sit back and watch, so he acts. He starts to fight Jiro, and after realizing his base is too weak, it leads him to power up into Super Saiyan as he matches the cybernetically enhanced android. Goku's fight is in his favor. His Ikari state proves to be besting Android 19 until he fires a blast to end the battle. This leads to 19 absorbing the blast. Goku's hard fires will also strike around this time, leaving him unable to fight. Seeing this, the Z fighters rush in, Gohan attempting to land a kick on 19's face, but the android catches the attack. Krillin tries to punch him from the other side, but he's caught as well. Tien appears above them, firing a Doran Ray, but 19 uses a key eye to blast the two back as he absorbs the energy of Tien's attack. Raditz blasts Jiro back as he goes all out and rushes towards 19, kicking his face. He jumps back and puts his knee on 19's back as he grabs both of his arms and rips them off. He proceeds to use the double Sunday in order to blow the android up. Jiro finds the opportunity to run as the Z fighters regroup and heal up. Future Trunks comes back and finds himself confused at the timeline once more as he realizes that the androids that they just faced look nothing like the ones in his timeline. Oma swiftly approaches with baby Trunks, who is Raditz's son this time around. Trunks realizes yet another difference, but he decides to focus on the task in front of him. Bulma confirms that this Android 20 was actually Dr. Jiro, and she explains that his lab is in a remote area hidden from most people. The Z fighters go on the hunt to look for it and soon come across it. Jiro had swiftly moved to his lab and awoken Android 17 and 18, who went on to kill him. Trunks warns everyone that they need to retreat, and being more level-headed than Vegeta, Raditz decides to listen as they all escape. Everyone regroups at Mount Pauzu at Goku's house. Chi Chi looks after him as Goku suffers the effects of the heart virus. The medication is given to him, but it hasn't taken its effects just yet. But Trunks has hope it will soon, so they can start to prepare. Kami feels a disturbance and calls for Raditz to come to the lookout. He talks to the Saiyan, informing him of his worry of this new creature that's appeared. He might be a bigger threat than even the androids. He puts Raditz on a mission to go deal with him while Goku heals. They can manage the androids later. Raditz agrees and goes to West City to deal with him. As he arrives, he notices all the clothes left as if everyone wearing them had simply disappeared. Just then, he's blindsided by a blast at his back. As he recovers, Raditz looks up to see Cell. Cell smirks. You came alone, Raditz? Big mistake. The two start to fight with Raditz, easily dodging every blow Cell launches towards him. Being that this Cell is from the future Trunks' timeline, he isn't filled with the same data from RZ fighters therefore making Raditz stronger for now. However, after absorbing the people that he did, he climbs in power enough to at least put up a fight. Cell still isn't stupid, so after seeing he's going to lose, he uses a solar flare to escape. Kami rages out at Raditz for failing. He can come back 10 times stronger and they might not be able to do anything. But Goku has an idea. The medicine kicks in, and after being healed up, Goku flies over to Raditz and Gohan, informing them of the room of spirit and time. Instead of seeing Gohan as a solution, he sees himself. He realizes that he has no choice but to harness his power. They aren't strong enough to beat the androids, but they will be. As 17 and 18 lay waste to Earth, Cell slowly gets stronger and stronger until he's strong enough to absorb both of them. 16 would try and defend them, but 17 is too stubborn to run. And without Piccolo and Tien, there's no delay. With 17 trying to stay back and help, it leads 
to cell absorbing him and eventually killing 16. While this was happening, Goku and Raditz started their training in the time chamber. Raditz continues to up his level of Super Saiyan, unlocking grades 2, 3, and 4. However, Goku is still stuck. Raditz tries to beat it out of him, but even when his rage flares, Goku's hair turns yellow for a split second, reverting back instantly. No matter how hard he tries, Goku can't harness his power. They pray that the training they've already done is enough to best whatever is out there waiting for them. Hopefully, Raditz's new transformation is strong enough. As soon as they come out, they sense an immense spike in power. A cell absorbs Android 18 as well. He too can sense them. He realizes how much stronger they've gotten and immediately wants to challenge them. Without Vegeta and Trunks to intrigue him initially, there isn't a desire for him to wait out 10 more days. He's just going to fight the strongest they have to offer now. And if they aren't satisfactory, Cell will just kill them. Goku and Raditz fly towards Cell as he flies towards them, meeting in the middle. The battle for the planet's survival commences. Goku and Raditz still hold their honor as Saiyans. The two of them have no plan to blindside Cell together. They're going to take him on one by one, and may the best fighter win. Raditz being stronger than Goku with Mastered Super Saiyan is first to step up. Cell tells him that he won't be the one with the advantage this time around as Raditz starts to power up. Cell smirks appearing in front of Raditz, attempting to strike him, but the Saiyan dodges and reciprocates with his own punch. Cell grabs hold as Raditz tries to kick him. The two stars stand still until Raditz tries to blast from his mouth, shocking Cell as he's sent flying back. He grunts, charging his power and flying back to face Raditz again. This time, he has a clear advantage. Cell stops playing around, repeatedly punching Raditz as blood starts to pour down his face. Goku watches his power start to spike more and more. He powers up into Kari, ready to step in, but Cell notices dropping Raditz. He flies towards Goku and lands a thunderous blow to his stomach. Goku immediately drops out of Ikari and falls to the floor, ready to bear witness. Cell lifts Raditz up with one hand, holding him by the collar as he charges a blast in his other one. Goku tries to move, but Cell plants him down with a kick. Laughing maniacally, he tells Goku that he's going to make him walk. Cell fires the blast, blowing Raditz's head clean off. Goku lays on the floor, helpless, as Cell approaches him with a similar blast prepared. He tells Goku not to worry about his brother too much, as he'll be joining him very soon. And afterwards, his wife and son will be next. Once more, Goku's failed to protect Raditz because of his own weakness. The same feeling he experienced against Frieza resurfaces, but it's stronger, more fierce. A boiling rage from inside Goku bursts out as the same green energy surrounds him once more. His body bulks up as Cell stands awestruck. Without a chance to think, he's struck in the face. Goku grabs his leg, throwing him back and forth. He stops only to kick Cell's face in. He grabs Cell by the neck, preparing a blast in his hand as he blasts him into oblivion, killing him in a similar fashion to how he killed Raditz. Kami's prepared to summon Shenron to put Goku to sleep, as he fears for the planet, but instead he sees Goku struggle to try and control his energy. He communicates with King Kai, who communicates with Namek, telling Elder Mori to use Puranga in order to bring Raditz back to life. A revived Raditz stumbles across the wasteland confused at what's happened, but what he sees is Goku's uncontrollable power right in front of him. He rushes to his brother, powering up in a super saiyan in case he gets attacked. He knows he won't be able to do much, but at least he can defend himself. He tells Goku that he can do it. He can control himself, and when he does, his brother will be waiting for him. A tear streams down Goku's face as his energy starts to calm down. His pupils returning to him, but at the same time, his power remaining the same. Goku stands up, hugging his brother. Goku, Chi Chi, Gohan, and Goten are enjoying a cookout with Raditz, Bulma, Trunks, and Bulla. The two fathers sharing stories of their past with their sons, telling them that Raditz initially came to Earth with intent to destroy it, but he changed his ways and became a hero of the planet instead. Chi Chi and Bulma enjoy a drink, with Chi Chi mentioning that Gohan's in high school now. He's well on his journey to becoming a scholar, and even though he does training every now and then, the Earth has his father and uncle as its protector. But he doesn't just study. In secret, Gohan is a great Saiyan man. The next morning, a new World's Martial Arts Tournament is announced. Goku, alive and well, starts to call everyone up to enter. He even talks to Gohan about it, but his son isn't interested. He goes to school and ends up getting called away by his Saiyan duties. Two trains are about to crash, but Gohan easily lifts one up to avoid collision. But what he didn't know was that another girl at the school, Videl, followed him there. She'd gotten suspicious of him disappearing during class all of a sudden. During the same day, a robbery commences in which both Videl and the Great Saiyan come to hell. That's when Videl becomes sure of who he is and blackmails him in not only training her but also entering the World's Martial Arts Tournament. What Goku wanted is done by the end of the day through the help of Videl. Goku had also been training Goten all these years. He not only has Super Saiyan, but it's completely under his control. He can also fly and control his key attacks as he pleases. Raditz had done the same with Trunks. Of course, everyone enters the tournament, which is also where Bobby's henchmen and the Kai's are. The tournament would commence as original, with Kibido eventually fighting Gohan and everything going down as he usually would. With Gohan being weaker, there's a lot less energy gathered, but still plenty for Bobby to be surprised. If 
all of pursuit with Shin leading the charge. He explains the evil of Majin Buu on the way there, and everyone understands the seriousness of the situation. They hide behind a nearby mountain, watching as Babidi kills Spokovich and Yamu. They all go back into the ship, with the exception of Dabura, who turns around, already knowing where they were. He swiftly moves in, getting ready to kill the beetle, but Raditz acts quickly, blasting him back. Babidi teleports Dabura inside, as they need to get as much energy out of these people as they possibly can. Goku, Raditz, Gohan, Shin, and Kibito enter Babidi's ship, with Raditz killing Pui Pui and Goku killing Yakon. Gohan starts to fight Dabura, but it's very apparent that the Saiyan isn't going to be able to hold out for long. Gohan is getting beaten down the entire time. Goku stands by, believing his son will bounce back, but Raditz isn't willing to take such a risk. He powers up into Super Saiyan 2 and quickly eliminates Dabura as a threat. They try and search for Babidi, who is trying to think of another way to get power, and quickly. He attempts to take control over Raditz, but the Saiyan has long overcome any trauma that could have resulted in him allowing himself to be controlled for a power-up. Cornered, Babidi has no escape, and is swiftly killed after Shin teleports everyone to his location. Boo is never released, and we get four more years of peace, after which Beerus awakens. The God of Destruction is on the hunt for the Super Saiyan God. He doesn't need to make a trip to King Kai's planet, because without instant transmission, Goku isn't training there. Instead, he heads to Earth, where everyone is at Bulma's birthday party. Tommy warns Goku and Raditz to be extremely cautious, and while Raditz does so, Goku is Goku and immediately provokes the God of Destruction. A fight commences in which Goku becomes a Super Saiyan to face off against Beerus. The God of Destruction is shocked by the power coming off the Saiyan. Maybe this is the Super Saiyan God. Goku pushes back against Beerus, both of their powers greater than everyone else's combined. As Beerus is pushed back by the Saiyan, he powers up further, resulting in Goku taking it up and under step into full power Super Saiyan this time. His hair, eyes, and aura turn green as he stares Bears Beerus down. The god is mesmerized by Goku's power. They start going blow for blow as their powers reach his face. Beerus notices that every time he rises his power to overcome Goku, the Saiyan is quickly able to close the gap. This is similar to what Broly was doing. He's able to climb the ranks of power extremely quickly because that's just how his power works. The same happens here. Goku is continuously increasing his power to match Beerus's. The God of Destruction quickly realizes that if he wants to beat Goku, he's going to need to put an end to the fight now. Otherwise, it might not end in his favor. He powers up into 100% and launches a Hakaya Goku. While he expected the Saiyan to be erased on contact, Goku's engulfed in the attack, but somehow manages to fight back against it. His aura starts to spark as he screams in pain. The Hakai dissipates as Goku's knocked back in the base, unconscious and falling from space at a rapid speed. Beerus smirks, rushing forward to catch him. He brings Goku back down and drops him off, smiling at everyone before leaving with Whis. He wanted to kill Goku for threatening his power the way he did, and he attempted to do it. But Goku survived his strongest attack, which impressed Beerus enough to let him live. Some time would pass with Whis visiting Earth on occasion to try some food with Bulma. Along these trips, he would run into Raditz, who alongside Goku would eventually convince him to let them train on Beerus' world. While training under Whis, Raditz would start to learn to get a grip over God Ki, unlocking Super Saiyan God and eventually Super Saiyan Blue. But Goku is a different case. He isn't able to learn God Ki at all. Whis concludes that it's likely because of Goku's rage-filled power. When he transforms, his power is so overwhelming that God Ki just isn't able to affiliate with him. Controlling God Ki requires focus and a different sense of control that Goku isn't aware of and is unable to access. Unfortunately, Goku won't be able to get such power, but Whis doesn't see this as a disadvantage. He tells Goku that he's never seen someone put up that good of a fight against Beerus in thousands of years. Maybe what he needs to do is stick with his current power and refine it further. He can help Goku in doing that. Of course, the next arc to take place is the resurrection of Frieza, which plays out the same up to the fight. The major difference would be that Goku doesn't have instant transmission. This causes some problems with actually getting to Earth. They would have to use Shin to do that, but because that takes time to think of, Frieza kills Gohan without anyone strong enough to save him. This would cause Goku to absolutely murder Frieza as soon as he arrives on the battlefield, not even letting him transform out of his first form. Goku's rage is once again showcased, but it's on a completely new level. His power and rage correlate, so when his rage spikes, so does his power. Whis witnesses a stronger and more uncontrollable version of Goku in that moment, which allows him to put together the basic premise of Goku's power. They use Shenron to bring Gohan back to life, and of course this would be an eye-opening moment for him. He realizes that he can't just rely on Goku and Raditz to get the job done. How can he protect his own family if he's dead? But instead of going to Beerus' planet, he approaches the Kai's. He trains with the Z's Sword, eventually breaking him when Goku visits and gets ultimate, setting him up on his original path in canon just much later. With his training being continuous up until the Tournament of Destroyers, Gohan's own potential results in him catching up to Raditz somewhat. He's still far away from being on the level of Goku, but he's making strides in his training. The tournament between Universe 6 and 7 does eventually come. Our team would consist of Goku, Raditz, Gohan, Goten, and Trunks, a team full of Saiyans. Naturally, Goku is first. 
of the tournament goes about the same with Raditz taking Vegeta's spot and beating Frost, Magetta, and teaching Kaba Super Saiyan. Everything is on the line against Hit, an opponent using time against him is something Raditz never anticipated, but his training with Whis has allowed him to expect the unexpected. Not just that, but training with Goku for all the years he did has given him plenty of skill to tackle the situation he's in. He quickly catches on to Hit's movement, starting to dodge attacks, and eventually start to land blows himself. It's more about figuring out how his time skip works, as Raditz is strong enough to tank most of the blows that he's hit with. This would eventually lead to his victory. Zeno would arrive at the tournament, striking fear in every last person there. Raditz would listen to Beerus, treating the god with respect. Goku isn't given a chance to intervene, as Raditz wouldn't allow his brother to do something that might mess with something that the two of them simply don't understand. This would result in Goku and Zeno not building the same relationship they did originally. But that's not much to worry about, as not long after, Future Trunks comes back to the past in an extremely fragile and injured state. In the future timeline, Trunks is frantically running, attempting to hide from a mysterious being. Whoever it is continues to lay waste to everything in their surroundings. As Trunks tries to lose the person, Mai jumps in, shooting the figure with her shotgun. As she grabs his attention, she tells Trunks to make a run for it. As much as he hates abandoning her, he didn't have a choice. He hears a key blast ring, believing that she was dead. Trunks enters a building where he meets with Future Boma, who's managed to prepare enough fuel for the trip back to the past. They put it in the time machine as Trunks gets in to escape, but as he does, he sees the figure appear once more, grabbing hold of his mother and killing her with a blast. As the dust clear, he sees clear as day the man behind the shadows. He's flung back into the past where present Bulma watches after him as Raditz, Goku, and Gohan wait for him to wake up. Once he does, he would frantically get up, analyzing his surroundings until his eyes set in on Raditz. He powers up into Super Saiyan and attempts to strike him, but Raditz effortlessly catches the attack. It confuses everyone there, but as Bulma comes into his vision, Trunks is calmed down. He starts to cry as he explains what happened in the future. Someone that looked exactly like Raditz attacked the future. He killed Bulma and laid waste to everything they fixed following the android's attack. They don't need to wait long to meet this figure, as in the future timeline, Black is searching for Trunks' key, but to no avail. He launches a blast, destroying what was left of Capsule Corp, but as he does, he looks at the hand, seeing his time ring. It clicks. Trunks escape to the past. He quickly uses the ring to open a portal and locates Trunks, appearing in the present timeline to the dismay of everyone. Raditz is shocked. It's him. Or is it? He's about to find out. Raditz flies up confronting whatever this person is, and before long, the two start to fight. Raditz uses Super Saiyan 2 and strikes Black in the stomach. Before being pulled back to the future by his ring, Black sends a blast to destroy the time machine, but Gohan is quick enough to act and takes the brunt of the attack. Beerus and Whis look at each other after noticing the time ring on Black's hand. The two of them would allow the Saiyans to use time travel for this, but first, they take Goku and head off to Universe 10, as they have to investigate this matter further for themselves. Raditz stays back and trains Trunks, seeing how much he's grown since they last met. There's an awkwardness between them, and it's not the whole someone that looked exactly like you, killed my mom, and destroyed everything I care about awkward. To Raditz, Trunks is a future version of his son, but to Trunks, Raditz is someone he barely knows. Vegeta is his real father, but Raditz killed him. It's a whole mess of things. On another note, Goku's fighting Zamasu on the Kai's planet in Universe 10, and after that, the group leave. Beerus starts to form his theories, but he has no hard proof, so he has to leave the suspicion as exactly that. A suspicion. Goku, Raditz, Trunks, and Gohan then travel to the future, where they soon encounter Black. Goku takes it upon himself to take Black on this time. He initially has an extremely easy time fighting Black, but he does notice the increase in power since he last fought Raditz. Goku can tell that Black is holding something back, and tells him to show off whatever he has left already. Black starts to laugh as he reveals his rosé form, but to his shock, Goku isn't much impressed. Maybe you should have taken my body. Goku starts to power up, shaking the planet as his power increases. Raditz smirks as Black looks on in complete horror. Goku transforms into his full power Super Saiyan state and proceeds to absolutely demolish Black. Zamasu soon arrives, leaving Goku to be annoyed. He truly believed that Zamasu was innocent. However, the Z Fighters had the situation completely under control. With Gohan present as an extra fighter, he and Raditz overwhelm Zamasu as Trunks cuts him in half. Goku sees this and proceeds to rip Goku black in half with his bare hands, but what they soon realize is that Zamasu is immortal. They can't do anything about him, but they can't all leave to go back to the past as that would allow him to escape and do something that they don't want him doing. Raditz decides to stay back alongside Trunks to deal with him. He feels like he has a responsibility to. He tells his brother to figure out a way to deal with him, and Goku nods. Goku and Gohan head back, first informing Beerus and Whis that their suspicion about Zamasu was correct, but more importantly, they need to figure out how to stop an immortal person. Without Piccolo, the idea of the Mafuba isn't presented, but Beerus has a better idea. He used it long ago to seal the Elder Kai because he couldn't kill him as the two were linked. He tells Whis to provide one for Goku, a sword. One clean strike and Zamasu will be sucked in, unable to do anything unless someone breaks in the future. Goku nods, thanking Beerus and heads back to the future with Gohan. 
This didn't take much time and the two didn't need to heal up either, so Zamasu is still being held by Raditz and Trunks when they get back. Gohan takes the sword and approaches a pinned down Zamasu. He shouts that they're fools. He'll just come back again. But Raditz smirks. Not this time, you won't. He cuts Zamasu and the immortal is sucked right into the sword as Beerus promised. Gohan gives the sword to Trunks who protects it with his life. After helping Trunks find new Namek and healing all of the damage done by Black and Zamasu the Z Fighters then leave. In the present, Goku, Beerus, and Whis head out to Universe 10 once more to confront Zamasu. After he makes his move in killing Goasu, Whis reverses time and Beerus uses a Kai to erase him for good. Without Zeno and Goku having a relationship, the idea of a tournament is never introduced to Zeno and without a tournament, Frieza is never revived, so Broly unfortunately remain stuck on Bamba. For now, this story comes to an end, but who knows? Zeno may decide to erase the good out of that end. Thank you guys for watching, like and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.